Dear Stuart, hello. <laughs> oh, how wonderful to be with you. Thank um, you. It's some time since we spoke, so it's yes. uh, gorgeous to see you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much for being here. It's such a pleasure for me to have this time for you and with you. I know you're really busy. And um, I was just reminiscing um, that 10 years ago, we had tea. I know it was a very long time. We had tea at the v &A Museum in London. And it was such a wonderful conversation. And that was the conversation where you talked to me about Diana and Diana as an ascended being, uh, the energy of Diana that is still with us, that is still um, affecting us in so many ways. And I, I know that your book is coming out in, mm. I think it's at June 15th in- It's June 15 in New York City, yeah. Fantastic. So I'm so glad to catch you right before then. Um, and I've read it. It's such a wonderful book. And it's so dear to my heart. Um, because actually, Diana was my kindergarten teacher. <laughs> and so I am one of those very lucky little children, three year olds that you see in those documentaries, like dancing around her. And it's actually one of my very first memories is of Diana, perhaps my first memory, which is really remarkable. <laughs> and in that memory, which was very special to me, what I remember was that when someone would get hurt or upset within our classroom, and it would happen, of course, we were just young children, they would often say to us, go to Miss Diana. Because Miss Diana was the one who would somehow take away the pain Miss Diana was somehow the one who would make everything better again. She just had such a kindness and gentleness about her and a healing energy. And it just always stuck with me. And I still remember the day that the guards came when it was announced that she was going to get married and she had to, to leave the kindergarten. The guards came and they sat by the door. They stood by the door and we all hugged Miss Diana goodbye. And it was such a tender moment. And I just remember everyone crowding around her and, and just holding her tight. And they, those moments really stayed with me. And it really wasn't until I spoke to you that day that I realized, oh, there is something bigger going on. So I wanted to ask you about your inspiration to write the book and what is this energy of Diana that's with us today? It's such a beautiful story, and uh, I'd forgotten that you had that extraordinary, unique connection with her, um, and how personalised it was for you. Yeah. Which leads me into a wonderful segue of who was Diana, what was her essence, and how did she have this effect on people around the world? Because, you know... Um, in preparation for the book, there have been the usual preparations of social media activities around Diana, the voice of change, which is the title of the book. And um, what's been extraordinary is that thousands and thousands and thousands of people click on the social media and leave a message. And they all have their own personal story of Diana. Wow. It's really staggering in the way that you felt so touched by her beauty, by her immediacy, by her authenticity, and by her love. Yeah. But everybody has this story. And if I tried to just inveigle them gently into, well, would you like to buy the book? Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, I have my own story. You know, it's very interesting that her vastness in the delicacy of the way that she was, in the fragility or the vulnerability of how she was, that she had this extraordinary appeal to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm immensely pleased that the book has come at this time. You know, it's all divinely inspired. But Diana, Diana was very, very remarkable in relation to that, the degrees that I've just really enunciated, which are her immediacy, her authenticity, and her empathy. Absolutely extraordinary. And um, the reason for me writing the book really arose out of that simplicity. 
because um, we can see that there is an arousal of the divine feminine in our midst on our planet at this time. And many, many ladies are wanting to gain some form of liberation, but are finding it very difficult because of years and years and years and years of either contemporary um, uh, oppression from the male or ancestral oppression or disenfranchisement from the masculine. And so I thought, well, you know, we talked about it very briefly, actually, en passant, as Diana was leaving a session one day, and this was July of 1997 so it was the fateful July and it was the last time that I saw her in flesh when she said to me you know the all the work that we've been doing is uh, has just been so amazing darling Stuart wouldn't it be wonderful if it came into it became a book but make sure you don't if you do do it make sure you don't publish it until the boys are married it was just en passant Wow. Purely intuitive. And I said, oh, no, no, of course, of course, of course, of course. And, you know, she hugged me and then we said goodbye and she was going off on holiday with Dodie and, you know, everything was going to be fine, it seemed. And it was only afterwards that it occurred to me, oh, my goodness. She had this predestination of producing the book. Diana, the voice of change, which is why I, I, you know, when I was considering, well, what is the front cover going to be? I didn't want to use another photograph. And uh, um, I, I, I wanted to find a beautiful painter who would paint Diana as she is now. And so that's the design of the cover. This is Diana as she is now, as an angel of vast luminosity, emerging out of the ether or emerging out of the collective consciousness of the divine feminine. I feel that she's very much there, surrounded by the other icons, the other archetypes, and that she is here very, very simply, although this sounds very esoteric for those people who are unfamiliar with this linguistic, that she is here to really help the women of the world and the men of the world to discover ways of moving into these extraordinary degrees of heart vibration, the inclusivity, the empathy, the unconditional love, and of course, deep compassion, because this was the way that Diana was it, at her best. Obviously, like all of us, she had moments where the angels of her worser nature came through, <laughs> but most of the time she was living the angels of her better nature, as Abraham Lincoln once said. Um, uh, and that was purely and simply to do with the fact that she was trying to discover a way of living the richness of her feeling capacity. Being an empath, it meant that she constantly felt overwhelmed by the very, very powerful, um, cerebrally scented people that were around her because she was a pure intuitive. She wasn't left brain oriented. She was very right brain oriented. We could walk into a room and actually sense the room immediately knowing who she needed to go and talk to who were in travail, yes. who, were not, who, you know, who, who were feeling uneasy. Anyway, I could yeah. go on and on and on and on, but please, you know, yeah. let, let me be directed by your questions. Yes, it's, it's so beautiful what you say. When I tune into her, esoterically speaking, and we do talk about esoterics on this channel, so hopefully it will be okay for the listeners. Um, I, I tap into her almost as a Venusian being. It just feels, I don't know if you agree, but it sort of just feels like there's this angelic nature, but also this love that she brings, this incredible uh, wrapping of her wings around the world. And it also seems as though she's really embodying one of the goddess Diana aspects in that crossroads position sometimes, you know, where she's sort of bringing souls through, you know, and through a portal and changing things in that way. So I really do feel that her energy is still alive. Um, and it's really fascinating to me how she was able to really transmute all of her pain into love. And that seems to me what she was doing with the, you know, the hospital patients or, you know, the children that she was working with as if she could just allow the pain to come towards her and transmute it. Although I'm sure there was a cost as well. Yes, but, um, you know, earlier in her career, royal career, I mean, 
uh, she found it very difficult to see a way of being able to transmute alchemically the negative into a positive. But by the time we worked together, which was just after the Martin Bashir interview of much renown recently, um, because we're recording in June 2021, and the Martin Bashir panorama interview with the BBC, it has just been discovered and proven legally that the the, the way or the route that the interview was accessed was actually through treachery rather than through deceit, rather than through um, the honest means that we all thought it was originally. I, I, or I met Diana immediately after this, and my experience of what she shared with me was that she was mightily relieved by the interview, that she wasn't challenged by the interview. It provided her with an opportunity of really speaking or unpacking her heart in a way that had not been permissible before. And of course, the identification of her divorce from Prince Charles was coming to a point of official recognition. And so... I felt that she was very, very, very revealed. However, back to the point that you were making. Absolutely. I feel that she was an ordinary human being of extraordinary status, which is why, for example, the third chapter of the book, Diana, the Voice of Change, is called The Anointed One. Mm-hmm. And that she was anointed by a very, very special archetypal decree Uh, to be a world savior, to be an emancipator, to be an egalitarian or humanitarian uh, presence in our midst. And I feel that we can sort of measure the enormity of her metaphysical capacity by the nature of what happened when she passed, which I write about in the book, because obviously there is this idea that it was a ritual killing of some form, maybe, I don't necessarily feel that it's necessary for us to delve into conspiracy theory. The point is that she did die in unusual means, but where she died and what happened when she died are the two significant factors. Because to give you a story, um, I think this probably would be about 15 years ago, I was in Paris for the first time since the death. I was working in Paris. And um, I'd finished the meeting with the CEO that I was helping in this particular merger or something that was taking place. And he said to me, we were at the Ritz in Place Vendôme, and he said, um, what are you doing now? And I said, well, I'm getting on the Eurostar back to London this evening, but it's not until 6.30 or 7 o'clock. He said, good, because there's a book I want to give you. So we'll drive across town. My chauffeur will drive me across, drive us across town. I'll give you the book, and then he'll take you to the station, and you can get on the train. So as we're going across Paris, we suddenly are there at the Garden Or. We're going down, sorry, not the Garden, the Pont, Pont de Almar, the Pont de Almar tunnel. We're going down into the tunnel. And of course, this is where she perished. This is where she effectively, where the car crash took place against the 13th pillar. And as we're driving through, of course, I'm very moved by this experience. He said to me, wait a minute, you worked with Diana, didn't you? Well, you know, she died here. And in Roman times, this was the Temple of Diana. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And I remember a tear came to my eye thinking, what? I've just been given something really crucial. And that brew within me, it just fermented within me. Yeah. And then when I started bringing the book together, Diana helped me write the book, there is no doubt. I mean, she was with me the whole time. You know, there were some very strange circumstances around the time that I wrote the book, which is now three or four years ago. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and I rem- remembered all of this, so I looked into it. And what I discovered was that indeed the Romans did have their temple there. Now they, lived, they left Gaul in around 65 AD, And a group of tribes called the Parisi took over and they venerated Diana. But it was later they were they were somehow um, moved away from the land whilst uh, feudal warlords stepped in and they were called the Merovingians. Mm -hmm. And the Merovingians celebrated Diana as their deity. So they refurbished or reconstructed the Temple of Diana. This would have been somewhere in the region of about 300 to 350 AD, all the way through for about 300 or 400 years. Mm-hmm. 
And they were um, constantly warring over land or disagreeing over land rights. And so, as usual, within that period of time, you decided a resolution through a duel. And the duels were fought at that spot. And it was believed that the person who was vanquished, the person who was um, slaughtered in the duel, that their spirit passed through this point. It yes. passed through a portal, which is why Ponte Alma means the bridge of souls. Oh. And it became God's eyes on earth at that point. Wow. And then time passed, of course, and they moved away from the land. And then eventually, when Paris became, you know, the early stages of Paris becoming the, the city that it was, that point became a hospice for those people who were near death. Wow, that's incredible. So the very fact that she cho- chose that point, that po- that point, that yeah. that geographical location to pass through on, yes. and then of course we noted this, the last factor that I wanted to share with you about her archetypal significance. The point was that three point five billion people wept during what's known mm-hmm. as the seven days of doom, or the seven days of bloom, from her her passing to the funeral. So I've chronicalized this in the book, you know, in other words, there are many, many, many books written about Diana, but none of them touch on her essence of who was she, not what was she, but who was she. And so this is really what the book is all about, because most of the women around the world at the moment are asking that very valuable question. We know who, what you are, but who are you? And how can you find ways of developing your sovereignty, which is what she was beginning to do, literally on an archetypal level, because the people's princess ceased to be and became the queen of everybody's hearts. That's incredible. It's huge. Yes, absolutely. It's, it so is. If, you, if you like, what I've done is I've just joined the dots. Yeah, in such a beautiful way. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you. And in her work with women specifically, there's so much around this sovereignty and boundaries. And so much of it is also linked to the voice, which I know you are a master voice coach. And so was that part of the work you did with her, this sort of, or that you suggest for people in general, for women, especially to find their voice through finding their signature tone? Absolutely. You know, you know and you, you've, you've used the, the, the absolute precise lead factor, which is that the thing that I do around the world, the craft that I have is to introduce everybody to the fact that we each have a note, which is our signature note, which is right at the very core of our physical geometry. And this was something that Diana had heard about because I was recommended by several people to her before I met her, and which is why she specifically realized that from a metaphysical and from a physical point of view, she wanted to literally bridge those two entities, as it were, and to really find her note, which is right at the center of our vocal range. So when we sound our note, we literally produce harmony in our bodies. And so all of our organic fiber, all of our organs literally come into synchrony. So when we're not sounding our note, it means that we're in disorientation, we're in disharmony, we're in disenfranchisement, we're in disturbance. And as soon as we find our note, all of those energies release and we bring ourselves back into centeredness, into harmony. And all our forebears knew about this. If we go all the way back into the sands of time, for example, in Rome, the belief was that we each had persona which we have extrapolated into the word personality. And of course, as we know, I mean, I'm looking at an Italian speaker (laughs) with Italian roots, persona means through sound. And so the Romans actually worked on finding ways of being able to reveal themselves through their voices, through sound, because they knew that sound was at the core of creation. Yes. And of course, every single, you know, the five great faiths, say the same thing, whether it be the Om or in the beginning was the word or the logos 
or the divine message or whatever, 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 the prima mobile. It's always about sound. In the world of science, we talk about the big bang, not the big silence, which began the whole of creation. So she was fascinated by this in a very elementary way and was very aware that her voice was very light. You know, and it was obviously, uh, uh, often the voice of submission rather than the voice of power. And so what I helped to do was to find ways of really sitting in her breath, because we can't make a sound unless we have breath. So we tuned into the power of pranayama, I- into the, the substance of our force, and how to really uh, energize ourselves in relation to the fluidity of flow through the breath. And then as soon as we find this, we it, it, our voices sit in the middle of this. As Rumi says, if words arise from the heart, they enter the heart. If words arise from the tongue alone, they don't pass beyond the ears, which is the contemporary cerebralization of our reality. We're all talking in the, and I mean, in the United States, America, it's nominally a little bit like that, you know, or something, whatever. As opposed to, you know, uh, literally sitting in the body and allowing the body to be a harmonized, unified field of light so that we can communicate the totality of our beings. Mm, yes, that's really beautiful. And I, I speak to something similarly with finding your um, your medicine in a way and the signature of, of your love, your life force energy, you know, and how to bring that out into your environment and radiate that out. Beautiful. Um, yeah, profound work. And um, I loved at the end of the book, you talk about the seven sacraments. Mm -hmm. which I found to be very powerful. Could you tell us a little bit about those? Um, Yeah. Yes, well, um, the point was that, as we knew, Diana was not going to become the Queen of England, but had been claimed as the Queen of everybody's hearts. And that happened just before the Martin Bashir interview. So it was a rite of passage that Diana moved through. So when she spoke to me about this and she said that she wanted to really find her very specific sovereignty, that I said, well, you know, the sovereign when consecrated during the coronation ceremony is anointed with oil. And so I feel that what we need to do is to authenticate or legitimize this archetypal flow of energy by looking into the sacraments that the monarch would be presented with as the defender of the faith, in particular, you're thinking about the British culture, you know, a thousand, a thousand, excuse me, very itchy note, a thousand years worth of monarchy. Um, And there is this very hallowed part of the coronation ceremony which interestingly in 1953, when Queen Elizabeth II was crowned, it was the first coronation to be televised, but this particular hallowed part of the service was not televised. And what happens is that the the monarch is, um, is, is undressed to a basic ordinary frock, and then dressed with the cape of the high priestess or high priest. And then the high priest in the form, in this land, uh, in the form of the Archbishop of Canterbury, steps forward with oil, sacred oil that goes all the way back through the sands of time to Solomon's temple and places the oil on the, the forehead, the breast and the hands of the monarch. And in that moment, it is believed that the Holy Spirit comes into that human being and they become lords, the Lord's anointed one. They become the king or the queen. And so if Diana was, uh, you know, what, what I indicated to Diana, well, if we're seeing you as this archetypal reference point where the human, be- human beings around the world will refer to you as a symbolic queen of everybody's hearts, as well as a literal I feel that what we need to do is to move through the series of sacraments that allow you to feel this degree of anointing. And if you don't mind, what I'd love to do is just leave it there so that the listeners can say, wow, that's really interesting. I must buy the book. Yes. (laughs) 
Absolutely. I don't want to give away the last the last chapter of the book. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Stuart. And of course, what I've done is to reinterpret the sacraments that are held within, um, for example, within the Church of England, that are held within canonical law. Um, and I've, what I've done is just to reframe them without adulterating them grossly, so that they become more applicable. They became more applicable for Diana. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as it seems to me that the women of the world are discovering their sovereignty, they're discovering their queendom, they're discovering the balance between the male and the female energies of power within them, that the sacraments are wonderful initiations, even if they're just dealt with in, um, in a cerebral way, you know, through instructional processes, rather than through ritualized behavior. The point is they, the points of recognition that they reveal remind us of the exquisite nature of who we are when we function purely through love. That's so beautiful. And yeah, when we can bring our divine selves as well into our human bodies and merge the two. Yeah. 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 It's so, so it's literally, as you say, it's about divine composure mm. so that our soul's blueprint opens to the possibility of what it is to be vessels that refract divine grace. And this, of course, is what we saw in the remarkable nature of Diana, both at the beginning of her adult life, which is when you met her, and you know, 13, no, it would have been 16, 17, 18 years later when she met her demise. She grew and grew and grew into this extraordinary being that was able to illuminate the conviction of the virtues that we're talking about. So beautiful, yes. And I really feel her wings just unfurling and gathering strength and then just really resonating, you know, reverberating through our lives in many ways. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Stuart. Um, are there any last thoughts, anything that you, you want to share about the book? Well, I'd love to say to everybody, please read the book and recognize that this is just the beginning of a wonderful project. This is my dream. This, is, this was Diana's dream, it seemed, through all of the wonderful tricklings in of her exquisite divine countenance. And that is that the book is the beginning of the development of the Diana Heart Path, which will be a series of workshops that will run all over the world. Uh, primarily, I'm seeing taught by ladies who are awakened to the unique evocation of who Diana was and how she speaks to all of us as a heart-centered being, because uh, right at the core of my work, as you know, I mean, we've talked about the signature node, but the signature node, of course, sits within our hearts, and I believe our hearts are the seed of the soul. And so um, there will be evocation processes, educa educational processes, opportunities for women and men to come together in co-creativity to discover how they can, how we can construct our lives in relation to a very new hierarchy of values, where love, empathy, inclusivity, and, and, um, and compassion are at the very, very core of those elements. So the Diana Heart Path will be embracing all of these es essential virtues of what it is to be a remarkable human being, in many ways, of what it is to be a human angel. Beautiful. I'm very glad to hear that. Very glad. And very much looking forward to seeing you back here in the States. Thank you. Well Thank with you. The, the Diana Heart Path. And um, I know you also have online offerings at the moment, and there's a beautiful Grail offering coming up as well. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Now that's really exciting on June <laughs> 19th and 20th. Yes, I mean, the book is so exciting, but it, lots of exciting things happening at the moment. Lots of yes, because I, I, I've been aware, I've, been, I've worked with a major teacher here in the United Kingdom for the last nearly 40 years, who's become a very good friend of mine. And, uh, and he has given permission for me to reveal the fact that he is a grail crystal keeper. Uh -huh. And so he has a crystal, which I'm going to reveal through oh, the nice. sacred pilgrimage. He has a crystal, which is actually Excalibur. 
So I'm going to be revealing this. My goodness. The energy that is encoded within the crystal is absolutely extraordinary. It was placed in the, in the land not far from Glastonbury Tor, which is the heart chakra of the world, as we know, um, in the fourth century. And it was revealed to him in 93. I was part of that whole uh, experience. And, um, and he is the keeper. And mostly the, the crystal is, is kept in a bank vault because it's absolutely extraordinary and very, very, very precious. And yet he got it out for me so that I could sit in interview with him on camera and present the, the crystal. So I'll be presenting the crystal in the two-day pilgrimage to firstly Glastonbury Tor, and then the Isle of Avalon, and then to Abrihenge, which is the great lunar temple, infinitely more powerful than Stonehenge. And so there's a lot of information there so that we can feel through ritual and through all the sacred practice that we'll engage in, which of course for me is always about embodiment. So there'll be very powerful experientials where we literally develop this divine composure and move into the levels of, enc levels of encodement that allow us to feel that we are of human angelic status. Yes. That's extraordinary. I'm sure our listeners will really love that. We're all about the grail here. So <laughs> that's extraordinary. I hope to join you myself. Oh, please do. Yeah, please do. It's, it's, so booking, it's, booking, it's booking out. And, and of course, there's yeah. an early bird fee pr uh, price that my people have put in, my team have put yeah. attached to it. So it's very, it's very delectable. Um, yeah, so please do. I mean, it can easily be found through www.theangelsofatlantis.com. Uh, forward slash events, then it pops up. Wonderful. Thank, and we thank will... you for mentioning that. Yeah, absolutely. I had it at the back of my mind. <laughs> um, but I will certainly be sharing all of your details uh, thank below. You. Thank you. And so people can contact you, know where to find you. And um, if anyone wants to um, share with you their feelings on Diana, your book, is there, you said there was a platform where people were connecting with you? Well, it, it, at the moment, it's mostly through people emailing me. You know, so okay, sure. I, my, my team processes all of the emails, and everybody has answered, of course, in the way that a, anybody that came forward to the wonder of Diana, that she would always deal with them personally, unless there was um, a challenge around their presence. You know, but yeah, everybody is everybody is given grace. Yes, yes, I heard that she used to love writing letters. She loved writing letters, lots of letters, <laughs> which I think is so marvellous, yeah. So, Stuart, thank you so much. I'm really grateful to have had this chance. Yay! There's the book. <laughs> Go out and buy it. It's wonderful, and your wonderful writing and so many tools and tips and so many wonderful quotes in there. It's a real treasure of a book. Bless you, thank um, you. Yeah. And I look forward to sitting and having tea with you again at the end yes, of the Yes, yes. <laughs> Let's do that when I'm in LA. Hopefully, if yeah. not at the end of this year, beginning of next year. Yeah, that's wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much, Stuart. Namaste, namaste. Sending you lots of love. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity. Thank you for being here. <laughs>